Hello everyone. Welcome another podcast episode, another week. I hope this finds you all well. I want to jump right in because I have a a sort of topic today that's bothered me for some time. Has bothered, bothered students that I've taught for some time. And it's one of those things in financial markets that's just sort of just below the surface. A lot of people don't understand it. Um, a lot of people don't really ask why. But it is one of those questions that I get every now and then, uh, whether it be from clients, whether it be from students, whether it be from other people in the industry. I survey people in my team about certain questions related to this topic, and some people didn't know the answers. So it just goes to show that the topic we're going to discuss today, specific indices in the United States, and you can do this for different countries, is just one of those topics that is a little bit confusing and is a little bit sort of in the weeds when it comes to finance. But it is super important, especially because a lot of you might invest in ETFs that reference some of these indices. indices. So why one over the other, for example? Now, if you've read the title of the podcast, you'll know we're talking about companies in the United States specifically. Last week, I talked about the MSCI World Index. I wanted to capture all global equities um, because I wanted to focus on sectors specifically, not necessarily the difference between US equities and European equities. So we talked about all equities from the developed market world, which led us to talking about Apple from the United States all the way to sort of Louis Vuitton in, um, in Europe and so something like Sony in Japan. This week, we're going to now focus on one market, and that's the United States. But we're going to sort of take it one level deeper and go, well, what are the different markets in the United States and why? Why is there an S&P 500? Why is there a NASDAQ? Why is there a Dow Jones Industrial Average? Right? All of them are stock market indices. Why are there three? And which one would we use if we were going to use one of them for whatever purpose? That's what we're going to dive into. Before we do that, disclaimers out the way. Although I don't think I need too many disclaimers for this episode. We're going to be talking more at index level. But... Uh, any stocks discussed in the episode or any industries discussed in the episode may be held by me in a professional per- personal capacity. And this episode is for informational and educational purposes. So please seek advice if you are going to invest and if you don't have the expertise. All right, that out the way. Let's start with the fact of why we need indices like the S&P 500. Well, me from a professional perspective need it for a very specific purpose. I invest in companies around the world. I choose the companies I want to invest in, and I want to choose what weighting I want to have in those companies in my portfolio. Clients of mine want to judge if I've done my job correctly or if I'm doing it well. So they have to compare me to something. If my job was to invest in companies listed in the United States, they would need some sort of US company benchmark to measure me against. And that's one of the reasons why we have market indices like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. It's because they're used as performance benchmarks for asset managers. And we actually pay the companies that own and create these benchmarks to get access to them, the weightings in them so that we can use them for performance appraisal purposes. Um, The names of the companies are in the names of the indices. So S&P 500 is owned by Standard & Poor's, S&P. The NASDAQ is owned by the NASDAQ, which has a stock exchange as well as indices. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average is owned by the Dow Jones company, effectively. So asset managers will pay these companies for them creating indices and keeping them up to date. So that's one reason why we have indices. The other important reason is company profits, company earnings, how companies perform is extremely important in the understanding of an economy. You know, companies hire people, they pay those people, they create products that they put out that employees from different companies purchase with their earnings. So companies have this unique spot in any economy that the strength of any company, the strength of a group of companies can tell you about the strength of an economy. If you have something like an, a recession, which we'll get to in definition terms in another episode, if you have a recession, typically companies are laying off employees. Those laid off employees are then earning less or nothing while they're laid off. Um, And if they're laid off and don't have any money, they're not sort of buying goods and services out in the industry. And that leads to economic growth falling. So the health of companies is a super important gauge of how our economy is doing. 
So that's also why we create indices to see how a group of companies is performing. Um, those are the two primary reasons. And then the third, which has proliferated a lot over the last couple of decades, is ETFs, passive investing. So I'm an active investor. I'll pick specific stocks based on my view of those stocks. Passive investors are passively investing in that they're not making specific decisions around what stocks they want to buy. But that leaves the question, what are they passively buying? And they are passively buying these indices. They're passively buying the S&P 500 at the weights that S&P have it in. They're passively buying the Dow Jones Industrial at the weight that Dow Jones decides goes in there. Uh, and same for the NASDAQ. So your choice of index for an asset manager is important. It's going to determine the correct benchmark. So the differences between the indexes are important. It's also very important if you're going to judge an economy. If you choose the wrong index, which weights itself or excludes certain stocks and maybe you're not judging that economy correctly and from an ETF perspective super important because if you're going to passively invest in something you need that thing to be right you need it to be correct in terms of what you want to invest in so for those three reasons market indices are exceptionally important that which is why we started with the sector conversation from last week if you haven't listened to that podcast or watched the episode go ahead and do that because after I discuss these three US indices and pick the one that I think we should talk about, I'll then use that index to compare to other countries. And I talk about the United States now because those indices are so well known. But to be quite frank, this issue appears all over the world. I manage a local equity portfolio here in South Africa. And in South Africa, there's multiple indices. There's the, the JSC All Share, then you have a capped version of the JSC All Share, then you have a top 40 version of the JSC All Share, you have a capped top 40 version of the JSC All Share, you have a Swix weighted version of the JSC All Share. All of, the, all of them controlled by the JSC, to be fair, but all of them slightly different methods of, of creating what goes in there and what the weights are. So even locally, from an asset management perspective, the index I choose to benchmark myself against, super important. You know, and I don't have to use the JSC's weightings. I could use the MSCI's weightings. Bloomberg has a weighting system. Choosing the right one is crucial. Okay, so that sets the scene for why it's important. Now, I chose the US because Dow Jones Industrial, NASDAQ, S&P 500, all super talked about indices, right? If you're investing in an ETF, you're probably going to invest in one of them. So it's, the, it's extremely topical. You've probably heard the name NASDAQ before, okay? Uh, and S&P 500, obviously. So let's discuss the differences. And I want to start with the weirdest one, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It, now, it is the weirdest one, but it's the oldest one, right? And it's quoted in all the sort of important textbooks of our time, if you think about the ones that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger reference. Um, the problem I have with the Dow Jones Index, especially in the context of today, is the way the index is created is extremely weird, okay? So, and you'll be able to judge the weirdness when I get to the other two, but just for the sake of where we are, there are 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Those 30 companies are effectively chosen by a committee of people that are trying to choose the best 30 companies that reflect the performance of the US economy. Okay, That committee will have to decide what 30 companies best reflect economic times, and they'll have to change that as we go along. In theory, if we just sort of stop there, that actually sounds quite good, right? We have people who, in theory, know what they're talking about, pick 30 companies that reference the economy. So if we're looking at the DJIA, then we should get a very good assessment of what the US economy is doing. Based on that description, I might want to invest in it from an ETF perspective. And it sounds like a good benchmark, obviously, also for an asset manager. In theory, yes, the DJIA has been very slow to update itself, especially as the world has changed around us and technology, for example, has become more and more important. The biggest problem I have with the Dow Jones Industrial, and this is why it's not talked about as much as before, is the way the stocks are weighted in the index. Now, remember, a weighting scheme is determined by each of these companies. Uh, the most simplistic weighting scheme you can do is equally weighted. Say I have a stock of 10 portfolios, uh, sorry, 10 portfolios. Say I have a portfolio of 10 stocks, an equally weighted portfolio would give every single stock an equal weight, right? And that's pretty easy to calculate. They should all add up to 100%. If there's 10 stocks, 100 divided by 10 equals 10. So in an equally weighted portfolio, every stock has a 10% weight. Okay, pretty simple, you're in and out. None of the indices we're talking about, the three today, use that method. Okay, it's a pretty simplistic method. What do they use instead? 
The DJIA uses a method where they take the share price of every company as the effective weight of the company. There is a sort of divisor underneath, which we don't have to get to now, but effectively, the larger a company's share price, the larger weight it has in the DJIA. Now, I guess maybe if you've never heard or understood share prices, weightings and things, maybe that sounds okay to you, but it is one of the dumbest ways to weight something you could possibly have, okay? Just you have to take my word for it. Share prices are very random. We'll get to how share prices are calculated post IPOs, how we value companies at some stage. But share prices themselves are actually extremely random, right? They, they effectively just pop out of a calculation based on the number of shares you have and the value of your company, okay? Because they're random, we can't compare share prices to each other. If I take the share price of Apple, which is about, at time of writing, probably 168, 169 dollars, okay? If I compare that to another company, it's not gonna give me a good reflection of which company is bigger. Take something like Booking.com, right? It's, it's, it's always the example that sticks in my head because Booking.com has a very large dollar share price. Its dollar share price, as we sit here today, is probably close to $3,600 or $3,700, okay? Does that mean that Booking.com is sort of 20X the size of Apple? No, <laughs> that's just not the case. What we typically do is we, try and find some sort of divisor to make these things comparable. So we'll say, well, what's the share price to earnings, the PE ratio of booking.com versus the price to earnings of Apple? Then we can compare the two together. But just straight off the bat, comparing share price to share price makes absolutely no sense. So the way that the DJIA is weighted for me makes very little sense. I would even go equally weighted rather than use the method that they use. And weighting is extremely important because Say you're an ETF investor, right? And the DJI uses these completely random weights. Therefore, certain stocks are bigger than others for a pretty random reason. Well, as an ETF, you're just gonna copy those weights effectively. That's what ETFs do, they're passive. So if you don't agree with the weights in the DJIA, then you're gonna have a problem in your ETF. From a benchmarking perspective, in the asset management world, I don't think DJIA is a fair comparison to what I'm trying to do investing in, let's say, US equities, okay? So the weighting scheme is very problematic from a DJI perspective. Still, it is one of the oldest indices we have. So a lot of people do still keep up to date with what's in the index, what the sort of movements are in the index, but you don't hear it quoted about or talked about as much as say in textbooks from the last 50, 60 years. Okay, so that's the DJIA. The NASDAQ and the S&P 500, which are way more talked about, those two use a weighting methodology that's a lot more reasonable, a lot more rational. They use a market cap weighting basis. Okay, so market cap is your share price multiplied by your shares outstanding, so the number of shares that are out there in the market. And that is a good indication of what the size of your company is in terms of value, value of equity, value of shareholders. Okay, so the largest market cap companies are going to be the largest, smaller, as you go down the list, smaller market cap companies are smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so if you look at the biggest stocks in the S&P 500 right now, right, it's Microsoft, it's Apple, it's Nvidia, it's Google, those are the top four, right, and all from a market cap basis are the largest, as you would expect, Microsoft's 3.1 trillion, Apple's 2.6 trillion, Nvidia's... I mean, it's crazy, but NVIDIA is now over $2 trillion, $2.15 trillion, and Google's about $1.9 trillion, right? Just sort of ranking them top to bottom. And how can we work out the weighting scheme? Well, it's just the sort of market cap, individual market cap divided by the sum. That's pretty much the percentage calculation. So in the S&P 500, loosely, because I don't really have access to the, I don't pay S&P 500 for access to the S&P 500, but you can work it out on your own. The Microsoft sitting at about 6.5%, Apple sitting at about 5.4%, NVIDIA is about 4.5%, and the list goes on. And that's directly linked to their market cap. Much better weighting methodology. It makes a hell of a lot more sense because if you think about how markets work, right? As your share price goes up and up and up, which has happened to all of these companies that I just mentioned, um, their market cap will increase, right? Because remember, number of shares times share price. If share price goes up, then that whole market cap formula gets bigger and bigger. Why that's a good reflection? Well, 
in an index, you want the larger companies in the index to be the companies that have outperformed because they typically reflect the companies that are growing in your economy. So if you look at this index, and there's actually a, a Insta story or a post probably on Instagram um, that, that reflects this. If you look at the S&P 500 from 30 years ago, right, there were not really tech companies in there. Your large companies were sort of Johnson & Johnson and General Electric and banks and telecoms companies, all sorts of things. And those companies bubbled to the top because their share prices were high. And their share price is high because those are the companies that were doing well at the time. And therefore, they deserve to be the bigger part of the index. As we move 30 years later into the sort of 2024 where we are now, technology companies have risen to the top because they're the part of the economy that's growing. So if we go to one of the reasons we use indices at the start, judging an economy, using a market cap weighted index like the S&P 500, like the NASDAQ, makes way more sense in the context of understanding an economy. I also think it's a good way to benchmark against an asset management portfolio. Okay, so that's the second lever. And then the third was from an ETF perspective. I think it's a good proxy for an economy. Therefore, it's a good proxy for an investment in the ETF perspective if you're investing passively. So a lot of people will generally pick an S&P 500 ETF over a NAS and say a NASDAQ ETF and not really buy a DJIA ETF. Okay, so that's the difference between DJIA and then the other two, right? It's that weighting difference. What about the stocks that are inside? Well, they're pretty broad based, both of them. The NASDAQ is the most broad based. And I'm talking about the NASDAQ that has about 3000 stocks in it. It basically tries to take all stocks that exist in the NASDAQ stock exchange. So that's thousands of stocks. The S&P 500, like the name suggests, has 500 stocks. There's also a sort of committee that oversees what stocks move in and out of the 500 because there are thousands of companies listed in the United States. But it's not as committee based as it is from a DJIA perspective. It's more, OK, cool, there's a bunch of companies that have grown now. Therefore, they should take their place in the index and certain companies will move down. It's very much a market cap weight thing. Why 500? Well, 500 companies actually a big enough number that it can reference an entire economy. OK, uh, from an ETF perspective, say, if you're going to replicate an index like the S&P 500, you're buying 500 stocks. If you're buying the Nasdaq as an ETF, you're buying 3000 stocks. The more stocks you buy, the more trading costs there. are. So if you can reference an economy with 500 stocks, that's great. OK, and that's kind of what the S&P 500 does. In South Africa, my benchmark for local equity is actually the top 40 index, only 40 companies in there. But in South Africa, 40 companies are actually a really good reference of what the economy looks like. In America, much larger economy, that story is slightly different. So that's the difference between what's in the two indices. NASDAQ, kind of broad based, 3000. The S&P 500, just 500, but nice broad base across the two of them. The one very weird thing about the NASDAQ specifically is that it doesn't have one very specific type of company. And those are sort of banks and investment banks, insurance companies, sort of financial, the financial sector. If you look across the NASDAQ, it sort of excludes financials. That's true for the NASDAQ 3000, which has 3000 stocks, and the NASDAQ 100, which has 100 stocks in it. It's a weird exclusion. And there's a few reasons why they do that. They talk about volatility of the economy and all sorts of things. I think it's an odd exclusion. But the NASDAQ index, even though it has 3000 companies in it, generally excludes financials companies like banks. The S&P 500 does have financials companies in it. Now, you'll notice I'm at a point where there's these weird distinctions, right? And we're ignoring DJI, but we're focusing on, on the, the two, NASDAQ, S&P 500. There's these weird idiosyncrasies between the two. One has 3,000, one has 500, okay? Um, one has financials, one doesn't. Sure, they're both market cap weighted, that's great. But the way these companies choose to construct their indices means that we need to understand how they construct the indices. Because if we're going to buy a passive ETF, we have to choose the right one. If we're going to judge an economy, we have to choose the right one. I personally choose the S&P 500. A big portion of that is because of the financials inclusion. Financials are an important part of our world. Banks, insurance companies, um, investment banks, um, the asset management companies. They're, they're so important to our economy that 
they have to be in our indices. We have to choose whether we want to invest in a JP Morgan or a Berkshire Hathaway or not. The second reason why financials companies are important is because they're so large that if we take them out, they leave a hole where other things are going to fall into the vacuum. Here's what I mean, because I know that sounded a bit um, murky. If Because there's very little financials in the NASDAQ, Everything else tends to go higher, right? We suck out this one lever, everything else goes bigger. What goes a lot bigger is IT, which is the biggest sector in both indices. IT in the S&P 500, which includes financials, sits at 27.5%. It's the biggest sector by far, okay? In the NASDAQ, information technology is 45%. And the reason for that is in the S&P 500, financials is about 13%, pretty big weight, double digits. And that weight in the NASDAQ is effectively four. There's, there's some small companies that are not effectively banks, insurers, that sort of thing. So what happens is, uh, especially for the larger sectors, they get dramatically ratcheted up in the NASDAQ. That's why typically when tech companies do well, the NASDAQ outperforms the S&P 500 because it has more tech in it. It's as simple as that. And the reason it has more tech in it is because there's no financials in the NASDAQ. Now, that distinction is crucially important, right? Now, in 2023, when tech did really, really well, the NASDAQ outperformed the S&P 500, as it should. What about an environment when tech doesn't do well and financials do well? That happened in actually 2022 when interest rates went up Bond deals went higher. Tech companies got absolutely smashed. We'll discuss why in future episodes. Banks actually do well when interest rates go up a little because they earn more interest on loans and things. And you have this delta where financials companies do better. S&P 500 outperforms the NASDAQ. So the, the, the differences between the indices, indices are crucially important. Okay. In terms of the biggest, IT is the biggest in both, like I mentioned. In terms of second and third place, second in both indices is communication services. We discussed this last week. That has a lot of tech in it. And you can see that by the fact that uh, communication services in the S&P 500 is about 13.5%. In the NASDAQ, it's about 21%. So again, that morphing up. And if you go to the third largest sector in the S&P 500, it is financials, 13%. And that effectively doesn't exist in the NASDAQ. Okay, quick summary, DJIA, 30 specific stocks supposed to reference the US economy. It's done so by committee, but the weighting methodology is by price and that doesn't really work. You then flip over to the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, both use market cap as their weighting methodology, which is great. One has 500 stocks, one has 3,000 stocks. The S&P 500 is the one with 500, but 500 is a really good, it gives you a really good assessment of how a market is doing. And then the big difference between the two, no financials in the NASDAQ, which dramatically morphs up your bigger weights, especially in IT, which goes from about 27.5 to 45%. The index that we use a lot to reference the US economy is the S&P 500, because you have to include financials. If I were to buy an ETF, and this is not advice, this is just sort of based on everything we've said now out of interest, the S&P 500 works better because it references the economy better, which is typically why people would buy an S&P 500 ETF over, say, a NASDAQ ETF. All right, and that, that's pretty much it. That's the in and out on the three largest or most talked about indices in the United States. We now want to sort of take that offshore. So the S&P 500 is going to be our chosen index. We now want to compare that to other indices. The UK index, the FTSE 100, the Stock 600 in Europe, the Nikkei in Japan, and try and see the differences. Spoiler alert, the US market has been the, one of the best performing markets over the last 20 or 30 years. Why? What is the reason behind that? Why are the other indices behind? Is it a sector thing? Is it a stock specific thing? You probably already know the answer. A big part of it is IT. IT dominates in the United States and is pretty lowly represented in other indices. And if you look at the names of the IT companies, your Microsofts, your Apples, your Googles, your Netflix, your NVIDIAs, they're far bigger, far more dominant in the United States than in other countries. And we're going to discuss why. Why? 
So you can see how that sector discussion from last week brings us nicely into the index discussion, where we can now talk about financials, IT sector, talk about what makes up these different indices. And hopefully, hope take away that jargon around indices. So if you flick on Bloomberg in the afternoon on Monday, well, afternoon for South Africans on a Monday, and they go, oh, well, tech companies are doing well this afternoon. The NASDAQ has done 2%, and the SP 500 has done 1.5%. You should know the difference between the two, NASDAQ, S&P 500. You should know why the NASDAQ's outperformed the S&P 500. And you should also know why they're not really talking about the DJI because of the bogus weighting methodology. Um, and hopefully then that sort of takes away that bit of financial jargon, which is one angle of my podcast. All right. If you've gotten this far, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the interaction. We've seen it across multiple platforms now. Um, hopefully you're enjoying it. If you've gotten this far, I dare say you have. Um, if you're not a subscriber already, subscribe where you can, like where you can, follow where you can, comment where you can. Um, we appreciate it. It allows us to know that we're doing a good job with these things. And, and that is the idea. Reach out to me on Instagram, slide into my DMs, reach out to me on social media or on the YouTube video or on Instagram, just the normal posts. I will get back to you. Feedback and support's always valued. All right. Next week, we'll probably discuss something like the United States versus uh, the stock 600 but there are some topical things happening like the reddit ipo and things so i may might go in multiple directions we'll see how i feel when i get there i'll catch you in the next episode thanks again for tuning in take care bye bye